Welcome to the Celts Are Here Champions podcast. Um, I'm your, your summer signing. Um, as to depart Celtic, I'm in the door here at Celts Are Here for a short time. So, yep, further at the deep end, this is my Champions League qualifier, guys. So, um, bear with me a bit rusty, even though obviously Celtic won't be playing Champions League qualifiers because we're going to be straight into the Champions League this season after our title victory. Simon, as someone who's won the league at Celtic, it's one of the most significant league titles probably since uh, Vim Janssen's uh, title winning season 97-98. What was your what was your emotions like after the, the, the winning Wednesday? Obviously, a draw, we didn't maybe finish it off and still you could see the players were a bit nervous, but obviously you've been there as a Celtic player. Um, what is that like when you're nearly at the finish line just to get over it and then the relief? Yeah, it's great. Uh, thoroughly enjoyed seeing the boys getting getting over the line on, on Wednesday night, as you said there. It seems to have been for a, a few weeks we've been waiting, you know, since really the one at Ibrox opened up that six-point gap. You know, it was a, a, a case of when and not if. Uh, and yeah, they, they, didn't, they didn't play to their best the other night, but they got the job done. Uh, I certainly, <clears throat> back in my day, would have preferred to have been a lot more comfortable, you know, with the six-point gap and, you know, the, the goal difference. But to see great performance all season from from Ange and the players. Yeah, um, Anthony, it's been, it's been a wonderful season. I don't think you could have wrote it at all, um, especially you know the, the mess that he inherited at, at Celtic Park last year. We weren't in a good place. We had people leaving the club. Obviously, we had New Lennon depart in the club early on um, last season. Scott Brown left the club. Peter Lobel left the club. We lost a lot of big figures, but the turnaround has been absolutely astonishing. And, you know, you, you could see how much it meant to him. The other night he said, I think, in one of his interviews that he was lost for words. Um, the scenes were absolutely great on, on Wednesday night. And I think even for, for fans who weren't able to get to Celtic Park or other venues last uh, season, it was just a real sense of relief for everybody in Tannadice. And It was. And it, was, it, was it was quite fitting that it was at Tannadice that they, were, they won it. Because that's last year, that's where it was officially lost. Um, with a nil-nil draw that handed Rangers the title. And, and just looking at the scenes uh, was incredible. Uh, just seeing Celtic fans partying again, watching it back, uh, watching all the videos of them back at Celtic Park at like one in the morning, fireworks being let off. I mean, we talk about I mean, I, Sky Sports News in our newsroom last night, everyone was going on about the atmosphere at the Spurs Stadium and everything. This is next level stuff when it, it's when it involves Celtic. Celtic fans, this is a real selling point for people coming to the club, people outside of the Scottish and Irish bubble who want to come and play at Celtic. They want to come and play in front of these fans because it is next level. And Celtic fans do party and best. And it's it was great to see everyone enjoying the occasion the occasion. And yeah, it was the players deserve it. You could just see like Celtic posted a video of the players walking out um of the gates of Celtic Park in front of the thousands of fans running the morning. And you just look at players like Jota, Hart, all that, all on their phones, just taking it all in, soaking it up. And you could, without knowing what exactly what they're thinking, you can just tell it was like, wow, this is this is unbelievable. Can't believe. It. I mean, they obviously know they've been been in the stadium for thirty eight games or so, and it's, they felt the atmosphere just getting over the line, just what it meant to everyone after last season. And I think yeah, they could all see that themselves. Yeah, I think for probably some of those guys that you touched on as well, Jota and Cameron <coughs> Carter Vickers, um, if their minds maybe weren't made up, I think those scenes can only help and, and benefit them because I was a real sense of you know, togetherness. I thought the other night I was at the game, it just felt as if, you know, it's always, I always say that the Celtic support and team, when everybody's united together, it's a, a really powerful force. And going forward, we're in a really good position um, at this moment in time. Simon, as I touched on, you know, a Celtic title victory, I think just because of the circumstances of last season, um, to win it back so quickly, you know, the recruitment has been spot on. Where does this rank for you? As I say, you know, I think a lot of Celtic fans would put it up there beside title wins in 97, 98, probably 87, 88 in Jock Steen's first title. But where does it rank for, for you, Celtic's 52nd title? It's, it's a special one, uh, Declan, because, as you say, we all watched last season where Celtic fell apart. You know, they really struggled, uh, couldn't get going at all. And, uh, you know, Rangers won the league from January onwards at, at a canter. Uh, so to, 
to get into this season with so much upheaval, a new manager who not many of us knew about, uh, if we're being honest, coming in and the amount of players that they had to recruit, uh, I think, you know, strongest Celtic fan out there or the more, op most optimistic Celtic fan out there would have probably said, you know, if we can get closer to Rangers, then that's success in Andy's first season. So to turn it around in such a short space of time and, and, and the manner and the style that he's, he's went about it, you know, he deserves all the credit. He's brought guys into this uh, club where, you know, they're, they're hero worshipped already. And it's an excitement and energy about the team. I think it lifts everybody that was here uh, last year, Callum McGregor as the captain, mm -hmm. looks as if he's back to his best, if not better but I think it, it comes with a lift from these new guys coming into the to the club and uh, a freshness and I was talking about it last night regarding Ange, I think it's more about the person uh, and the football kind of comes second, you know, when he looks at these guys the, the profile, you know, you, you talk about the camaraderie there and the togetherness, I think it's the type of person that he's brought to the club as well Yes, they've got to be uh, good footballers, which all these guys are, but it's the type of person, the character, that I think he's brought to this uh, squad that's evident and then, you know, it shows in the results this season. Yeah, I think you even see that in the, the, the celebrations. You see Joe Hart, he's moving the board round and saying, get the fans into the, the, the picture. And again, he was a, a character who we'd all known, we'd all watched him at Manchester City, really, really successful England goalkeeper, came up here probably and himself had a point to prove, just that he you know, wasn't finished and he spoke about this being revitalised. But and for you, on that point that, that Simon's talking about there, we, we'd heard that Ange had spoken to Paddy Roberts, for instance. Obviously, he's going to be a big one playoff final and... I don't think Ange thought he suited the system. Um, so again, I think that's a a, a big point, and we'll, we'll come on to recruitment. But in terms of Callum McGregor, he was the the only man left standing from the the day that Celtic actually relinquished their, their title up at Tannadice um, over a year ago. Ange probably couldn't have got a better captain than Callum, and his contribution this season has been absolutely, you know, it's been breathtaking at times. But what's been your thoughts on Callum McGregor for Ange? It's it's been amazing um, just how he's grown into the role. He had such large boots to fill in Scott Brown. And Scott Brown had a very different style of captaincy. Scott Brown was very aggressive. He was very in your face in front of the opposition players. You could see the... Um, you can see like the, the vein on his head when he's doing the huddle and, and talking um, into it. It was... Uh, it's a very different... Callum seems a bit calmer. And I actually, this time last season, or... Um, I was thinking if McGregor gets the captaincy, I was I was wondering whether he was the perfect person for this role because I, he, he was a bit quieter. I didn't see the same kind of captain, captain and leadership skills as uh, I guess Scott Brown had. But he's really grown into the role. And he's really made it his own and he's he's taken taken it under his wing and, and, and just taken it into stride. And it's been so good to see because uh, he's such a clever and such a good footballer and it often goes missed the kind of role that he does because others take the limelight like Jota getting assists um, bad players like that in the midfield Rogic and but what McGregor does for Celtic is brilliant on the pitch but now we're really seeing what he's, what he's doing off the pitch and Joe Hart mentioned it when he signed that McGregor called him up or he had, a, he had a meeting with McGregor and he was just so impressed with him. And if, if someone, Joe Hart's level, who's been there, done it all at the top level, is impressed with Callum McGregor as a captain, this even last summer, I think that goes to show <coughs> some bounds in terms of his character and in terms of stepping into this role. And it's, it's, it's great to see. Yeah, and he's Mr. Consistent. And I think, again, you know, as you touched on, Simon, it's about the character. And I think Callum's always been a really unassuming footballer. He's always been a really genuine kind of guy. Um, on Callum McGregor, Simon, you played with a lot of top midfielders in your time at Celtic. Um, <coughs> as a player, where, where do you think he ranks just now? And again, it's even frightening to look at him. We could have another 10 years of Callum McGregor at Celtic. Yeah, it's incredible the success uh, he's had. I looked at James Forrest today as well. The, 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 the medals that these guys have accumulated over the years is incredible. It's a real testament to how consistent they've been. But for me, Callum McGregor's been my favourite Celtic player for a number of years. You know, uh, 
well before he got this captaincy. But when you do get the captaincy at Celtic, I think it's a it's another huge pressure. That's a a big responsibility. And I just remember back to the the, the semi final recently, where obviously disappointed with the way the th- things finished. But he got the guys into a huddle at the end, and I think he was just stressing that you know this game's finished. We've still got a job to be done, and I think the big game for them then was up at Dingwall in the next game because I think everybody outside of Celtic was was hoping for a slip up, you know, and the pressure was on them, but they went and got the job done. So I think I think he's grown into it. He's probably had an apprenticeship of this role under Bruni because he's been there that long. But uh, Anthony's right, he's, he's a different character to, to Scott and he very much leads by example. I think he's the guy that makes Celtic tick. And I really think the, the guys that have come in round about him the pace and the creativity, I think it's really helped him, you know, kick on his game. I think he's enjoyed playing. Guys enjoy playing the good players. And uh, after last season struggling as a team, you know, I think it's a huge lift to the guys that were already there. That the guys that have came in have really lifted the team to another level. Yeah, I heard that in Peter Martin's re- even recent interview when he lent him and he said he felt sorry for Callum last season and he was just you know, it just didn't work out for, for Callum last season or Celtic, but you know, he's proved... these, these guys can only go to the well so many times, you know, you, you were looking you were probably looking for the recruitment last year to help these guys that had been over the course and that never happened. It's been it's been the opposite this year, you know, they've really come in most of them have hit the ground running. And with him playing at the heart of that Celtic team, it was a, it was a big boost for, for him. Yeah, and you know, guys like Beaton and, and Rogic, who I'm sure we'll come on to later, have found another, you know, bit of form under Ange and been absolutely pivotal this season. And for as Simon talks about, you know, the recruitment's been spot on. I think for Ange, there's not really a player you could say hasn't contributed his part. Um, pound for pound, who would you say was, was, has been Celtic's best signing under Ange, obviously including uh, the, the four that we brought in in January? I mean, how, how can you pick one? I don't know. Really don't they all have played their part in some kind of way. I mean, you look at Jota with the goals and the assists, Sabada with goals and assists. Kyogo just looks like a, a special player. I know he was out for such a long part of the season, but when he's been playing, he's turned up all the time. Um, it would be great to get a full season out of him. Hitate, Maida, they, I think Hitate especially, looks like a real player. I think a real playmaker. Um, his, his awareness, his touch, his vision is superb. I just think he needs a, a rest. And he, he said, actually, he said it himself in an interview with the Japanese uh, media, but, but he's tired. He's had a full season in Japan. Had um, some extra playoffs, I think it was, after as well. And um, come straight into Celtic. Had had to use the winter break as their pre-season. Mai does the same. And uh, I, I can't wait to see what they'll be able to do because I think I think those two um, what could be really key to signings, and we can see that even more next year. O'Reilly, the looks of him, Robert just replaced him already, and you've got Starfelt coming. He's coming to a game. But I think Carter Vickers might be a pick. I think the way that Ange plays. <coughs> Have to have a solid foundation at the back, and you have to have someone who's so confident in the ball, so assured in himself, um, and will win headers, win the ball back, but also be able to pick out the right pass to go forward. And I think Carter Vickers has been instrumental in that. And I think Celtic really need to make it a matter of priority to get that deal over the line and uh, make it permanent. Um, but I also want a special mention for Joe Hart, not not just for being a goalkeeper who can save shots this season, um, which I think we uh, missed last season. But the influence that he seems to have on the, in the dressing room, the experience, just, and also the, the newfound energy that he's got and the new lease of life that he's got um, seems to be rubbing off on the players in the, in the dressing room. And I think he's been a, a real key signing as well. But if I had to pick one, which is a, a stress there, it was so hard, I, I'd probably say it was Carter Rickers. It's actually quite amazing to think that Vickers came in so late as well. I think he was signed on a deadline day with, with Jacques yeah. Amakis and Jota too. So he wasn't in right at the start. Oh, but he, he's, he's even played his, his part big time as well. 
just the, just the 14 goals for the big man, I think, in 14 yeah. starts or something. I cracked the head the other night. I actually thought it was going to finish 1-0 and it would have been quite fit and had to win the league again. 1-0 at Tannadice with a header from the, the, the striker. Um, I, for me, it's been Joe Hart because I just don't think that, you know, it's not that I don't trust Scott Bain, but I just think that losing experience of Scott Brown last season, um, you know, there was big figures left from that dressing room, obviously. I've already touched on Rogic and Beaton are going to go um, now. It's been confirmed today. I just think Joe Hart coming in there was a big character. Um, probably somebody that Cal McGregor's rubbed off on a bit. You've seen him running over to Ange and, and games and kind of talking to him about what he's maybe seen from his goal. And I just don't think if you took Joe Hart out of the Celtic team, but it's probably similar to what you're saying, Anthony, about CCV, would you trust somebody else going in there? So for me, it's Joe Hart. Simon, how about you? Who would you say? It's been most influential. Like, like, like Anthony there, it's, it's difficult to, to single one person out. I really think he's made a good case there. For, I think Joe Hart's more than a goalkeeper, you know, coming to Celtic, the role that he's played. I think he's another captain. You know, he gets the club, he gets it, he gets the fans, he's got a good relationship with the fans. He, he, he's vocal there. I think he went on record saying that Carter Vickers and Starfelt aren't the most vocal centre-back pairing that he's played behind. So I, I'm guessing that he probably organises that back four at, at times and you can see the benefit you know that the two boys particularly Starfelt was under a bit of scrutiny at the start you know but I think the two of them it shows they've got the best defence in the league this year I think they've grown as a real partnership the full back areas have changed at different times uh, but I think more, more without sitting in the fence it is hard to pick I think that the, the important thing in the success of where Celtic got their success this year was Every one of them played a part at different times. So Kyogo was phenomenal at the start, but then pulled up injured on Boxing Day, I think it was, at McDermott Park. Mm. Then you get Jack and Marcus, who'd struggled, you know, to get up to the speed. He'd missed a penalty against Livingston, which I don't care what anybody says, it would have affected his confidence, I think, a little bit. Mm. You know, it's a big role playing a centre forward at Celtic. There's a lot of... Uh, scrutiny on that position as well but he, as you say 14 goals so the, the, the void that Kyogo leaved, uh, left was you know wasn't that evident because you get another guy coming in and scoring I think the, the, the recruitment at the turn of the year really was perfect timing you know to, to kick on I remember watching the St Mirren game just before the turn of the year where Celtic struggled they didn't have a lot of uh, options on the bench that night but Ange had already identified Maeda, Hatate, O'Reilly, who all came in. I don't know if Maeda started the game against Rangers, but the, the other two certainly did and, and hit the ground running. He so, just came back from internationals, I think, so he was in the bench, right. if I remember right. He just arrived. Hatate yeah. got two, O'Reilly was great that night. I just think players of, you know, the, the Jota at the beginning, very good. Maybe dipped a little bit, but I think he's back to his best mm. yeah, towards the end of the season, the last few weeks. Everybody's played their part in this uh, this league one, so I think it's really important. So I can pick one. No, that's fair enough. Um, again, I think Lila Bad is well in for a mention too. Abad I mean, I think we'll yeah, forget fourteen goals for a nineteen yeah, year old. Tremendous assists as well, and that's at his age. I think we'll forget. You know, he's only he's only twenty, so he's going to kick on um, under range absolutely. And again, he does that thing. You see, my either doing it all the time. You know, coming in from the wing and always getting that wee goal at the back posted to them do that really really well be really exciting I think to see Maeda after a, a full pre-season I thought it was great somebody asked him in one of those Q&As the other day you know where does he get all his energy from very simple answer he said my wife and my kids so again back to talking about individuals and the kind of people that they are really grounded guys I think that we've got in it at Celtic just now yeah, Anthony you know, you, know, you know what I really liked the other night when, when I was watching the scenes back everybody's celebrating and, you know, I've been in that position myself. The, the three Japanese boys were out doing extra running. Did you see it? And, I saw it, aye. And they had a smile on their faces. Normally, when you're asked to do that after the game, I mean, I hated it. You know, having to go back out and maybe get top up your fitness. These guys, they seem to be so focused. And it's actually scary to think what Maeda's energy will be like after a, a full pre-season. Yeah, it is scary to think that. Um, Hatate too, I mean... I think you can actually, you can see it and I'm just now that it may be struggling a wee bit just with, you know, so much football and adapting to life here in Scotland. But again, he's going to be a top, top class player. I think it's Celtic. Anthony, as Simon touched on there, you know, I remember that St Mun game well. Um, 
It's the only game I've missed this season domestically. I had COVID, so I had to watch it in the telly. No, the best game to, to, to miss anyway. It was freezing cold. It was a December night just before Christmas. So, no, no draw. I remember reading through Twitter that night, and some people were, I think, edgy. I think as a lot of Celtic fans have been this season, the worry was there. In terms of expectation, um, at the start of this season, I don't know what your expectation was. You can, you can let us know. But by that time, you know, after the League Cup final, I think it was just all about staying in touch up until January and we knew that the signings were going to come. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, expectation level at the start of the season for me was really low, really low. No matter who came in, even after Lennon left, I just looked at this. The rebuild for me was just too much on and off the pitch. I mean, the Celtic were looking at restructuring. They were looking at getting Eddie Howe in as a, a head coach and having a sporting director. And they were going to have a new chairman. They were going to have, um, sorry, not a new chairman, sorry, a new chief executive. I just felt there was going to be too much change on and off the pitch for Celtic to do anything major in the league this season, no matter who was in. And then it turned out Eddie Howe wasn't coming and they, they got Anjan just like, what, two and a half weeks before the, the, the first qualifier. Mm-hmm. And that's not, that's not against, anything against Ange. Uh, I just felt no matter who came in, this season in the league was going to be a write-off. And boy, have they rubbed egg in my face on that. <laughs> They've, it's been an amazing turnaround. And but even, like, you're, you're talking about that St. Mirren game uh, just before Christmas, I thought I was still in the position that we'd, we'd seen Ange ball, we'd seen glimpses of this amazing brand of football, this amazing winning football, which is a key part as well. Um, but we're still in this transition period. But games like that kind of brought you back down to earth and like rem- you made, made you remember, look, this is what Celtic have done already. They seem to be a lot further ahead in the progress that they've made. And even then I was thinking... As long as Celtic can win a trophy, which they had done by that point, but what success looked like for me at the start of the season was if Celtic can win a cup and give Rangers a bit of a run for their money, that and show signs of real progress. That's success this season, and I mean, but look at the success they've had. It's it's ridiculous, and the game that really made me feel that they could go on and win the league was the three 0 win at Rangers. They just that first half of four, that first 45 minutes was just, I think the, wor- the only way to describe it was explosive. It was explosive mm. on the pitch. They just absolutely destroyed them. But at the stage was set before the game, there was just Celtic fans inside. It was a Wednesday night. It was the atmosphere just like, I wasn't at the game, but you could just feel the atmosphere from, from the TV screen. And the whole isolating Rangers with the huddle, the, the spotlight on the huddle, how that must have felt as an opposition player with none of your fans there, 60,000 Celtic fans in there, the noise levels and and the, being in total darkness in the spotlight being <clears throat> these 11 players came flying out the traps and just went and blew them away in that first 45 minutes. I, I, I don't know myself what it would be like as a footballer in that moment, but I could only imagine what it was and what, what it felt like. And that was the turning point for me. That is when I actually believed, this, and even then I didn't think Celtic were going, to, going on to win the league. I just thought the title race is on here. Celtic are, Celtic are a match for this Rangers team and they're really on it. And um, that, yeah, they, they went on to do amazing things in the league. And it, it, the, people talk about, I mean, fans of other clubs will say, Ah, it's not that amazing. Celtic got one of the biggest budgets in the league, and everything. but if you look at the size of the job, and I just described it, the, the change off the field, the change from the field. Look at the starting eleven; it's basically a new team, and for everyone to click, for for all the players from different countries, from different cultures, that have suddenly come into this squad and just click, and that's that says a lot about Ange Postecoglou in terms of who he wants and how he how he brings them in and just getting players that are going to fit the system but also fit the character and it's a real testament to what the job he's done he's he's been a breath of fresh air yeah he's absolutely been a breath of fresh air um that 3-0 game definitely one of the highlights this season 
Uh, Simon, you've obviously played derby games against Rangers. Um, not one where it's just 60,000 Celtic fans in the stadium. But again, I even think, you know, thinking back to that St Murn game, there was a worry. Remember, obviously, fans were then locked out of the stadium. Um, the, the game I put me down with part, no fans in. The reason why it was a Wednesday night against Rangers was because it had been shifted um, to try and allow for fans to get back. And I even thought that was a big moment this season because I really couldn't envisage, again, going back to you know, an empty stadium and that, that game against Rangers could have been completely different. Um, Simon, how about you? Any, any moments? I know it's very hard to pick one, um, but a moment that maybe you thought, well, th this is on. I, I think that there, you know, is probably the turning point. I mean, and you've actually just reminded me there of, you know, the, the, the no fans and, and, and holding back to towards the end of January before we, we regrouped and started the league again. And it probably did play a huge factor, you know, as Anthony says there, I was at that game, 60,000 Celtic fans, the atmosphere, electric, they came out the traps really quick and had the game wrapped up by half-time. Uh, must have gave everybody at the club such a lift because Rangers had had the better of those games over the last season or so. Uh, so it was, a, it was a big turnaround and probably gave the boys a, a confidence boost to think, yeah, as Anthony said there, that the title race was on. And then for me, I thought it was just down to who would handle the race better because the year before Celtic, for whatever reason, couldn't get close to Rangers and they kind of cruised over the line with no real pressure. I thought this year, you know, it would, let's see what Rangers have got because Celtic aren't going away. And to their credit, they not only went above Rangers, they opened up the gap. You know, the next big one for me was going to Ibrox and, and really having a chance to put a, a major dent in the race uh, as far as Rangers were concerned and, and had a great 2-1 win, one, one, where I thought for the first time that they showed different qualities. Mm. You know, second half, they were up against it for most of that half. They defended really well. This was a team that at the start, uh, yeah, it's all very well going forward and what, uh, scored goals, but claimed they couldn't defend. They, they defended really well that day. Uh, and I, th I think that would have given Ange a lot of belief as well in what he's got there because they, they won that game differently. Ugly, some people would say, because they got themselves in front and then defended for 45 minutes. Yeah, I thought Starfield and Vickers that day were absolutely uh, immense at the back. Um, and again, you know, I think there's loads of put, uh, different games you could look at, you know, with that. That mindset of we never stop, you know, the game up in Dingwall where we're kind of cruising for a bit after a bad of scores, they get the equaliser and you're waiting until that goal, Ralston pops up with it, Jot up at Pataudry, you know, Celtic, I don't think they'd won an away game for something like six months until Jota get that goal up there late on, game at Christmas coming back off the back of a scalp at Motherwell. You know, Aberdeen responded really quickly, it ends up two each and Celtic get a goal to go three to ahead. And even I thought the game at Tyne Castle, if you remember back, you know, lots of players away in internationals. They had the injuries. There was questions whether Jack and Marcus could come in and do the business. I think that was just after the game at Alloa in the Cup. And we held on. I think that was, was that when Hatati scored that night, obviously. And it was, oh, right. That's right. And on his debut. 2-0 up in cruising, weren't they? And then yep. um, went to 2-1. Yeah, and then yeah. Royce had a penalty. Yeah, that game as well, yeah. Twice hit mm. both posts on the penalty and somehow it stayed out and just getting that rubber the green is what you need and but you, you make that kind of luck yourself as well don't you once you start grinding out results like that yeah absolutely and I think in all those games you go, you've kind of come off with different bits of luck whether it's Roger getting that ball in for, for Ralston you know the cut back from Montgomery that Jota bangs into the night the, the wee bit of you know I think there's a wee bit of Jiggery Pokery, whether Jota was offside for that goal in the 3 2 game up there, the one that he hits in the volley and it bounces into the ground. But again, you make that look for yourself. And yeah. there, um, was another, there was another one I'm just remembering just now where Rangers were playing before Celtic and slipped up against Ross County and we were at home at Dundee United. I covered yeah, the game. Big game. And there was a lot of frustration because everybody, the players were known as well, the incentive of that game, you know, after Rangers slipping up. You could feel the tension in the, the, the stadium because the goal hadn't came. And then the scenes when Abada scores, you know, so late on. I mean, little things like that as well. You know, Celtic always seem to come up with an answer. 
Exactly. Sorry, so the exact same thing happened against Dundee as well, didn't it? Jackie Marcus scored a late goal to make it 3-2. Yeah, 3-2, that's right, yeah. yes. There are quite a lot of uh, late winners, um, almost almost as many as... I, don't, I remember one season under Strachan, Celtic just kept on scoring late goals. And actually, if you looked at the table, if they hadn't scored in the last uh, 85... Uh, after 85 minutes, they'd have lost the league by some amount of points. But uh, it's, that's the sign of champions. If you can keep going with the You've got it here on the, the graphic. We never stop. And that's what that has been the, the motto this season. That is what Ange lives by, isn't it? Yeah, and as you saw, we saw the players with it in the back of their t shirts the other night too. And you know, it was it was a reflection because that has been them as a team this season. What Simon touched on, you know, after the game, you've got players out doing sprints at the end of the game because again, they're just so committed. I also like I think with Ange and even the players that you can tell that a lot of them are just real lovers of football. And even Carl McGregor, I've always think, has been a great student of the game under Ronnie and under Brendan. That they're there and they're learning continually. That they're not just thinking, "I've made it here." They're real students of the game, and I think Angie's probably still a student of the game. You know, when you hear him talk about football, you want to listen. And um, one of your former teammates, Simon, I was doing an interview with Peter Grant, and he says that in Angie's team, you see a real identity that you get from his press conferences. And he said he's always said. Um, you know, to play at Celtic, you need to not just be a footballer, you need something else about you. Would you agree with your old teammate in that the identity is there in the team and that you need to be not just a, a decent footballer to play at Celtic Park? Yeah, you need you need that mentality, that, that, the mental strength. You know, it's it's not just any jersey to put on. And, you know, the demands of the support, the club, everything about it. You know, I, I haven't experienced it anywhere else I've played. You know, so... I would agree with Granty, but as I go back to what I said earlier on, I think that's what Ange identified. That's part of the profile of the players coming in, you know. And, the, and another real positive is you look at all these guys, they're all uh, young, you know, they've all got a bright future ahead of them. You, you talk about Jotas, Hatatis, Abadas, they're all early 20s. Uh, so, you know, that is a big plus as well for these guys that they, if they're choosing to be Celtic and we hope Jota signs, you know, his best years are ahead of him. He's only going to get better. He's now got a platform at the top table in terms of the Champions League that he can go and show what he can do. And yeah. again, the other exciting thing is the recruitment. I mean, Ange has now got financially, you know, stronger position to go and, and get recruitment. Where does he go next? Because he's produced some superstars that all the fans have grown to love over one season. Or ten months. Where does he go next? I think that's an exciting thing for me. But how does he improve the team and move forward? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that happens. And again, Anthony, one of those, uh, as Simon touched on there. You know, we've got Champions League football, and I've seen Celtic's already been linked with players. Obviously, we've seen who's going to be going out the door. We've got James Forrest in an extended contract here. Um, at times, Celtic have been accused of waiting until the last to see if we're in the Champions League before we go out and spend money we're just in a real strong position here and I even think the addition of Mark Lowell coming in um, being announced I don't know if he's been working in the background kind of de facto with fans but obviously we know that he's worked with fans at, at Yokohama I think that's going to be a real improvement and it puts us in a good place entering this summer window because I already think that Ange's probably prepared and picked out who he wants and you know figures like Beaton and Roderick leaving the club maybe show that we're, we're probably going to be relentless here and I wouldn't be surprised to maybe see three or four first team starters probably arrive this summer. Yeah, and it's good to know it's, it's going to be a weird summer actually. I don't think it's the last time was 2008. Celtic were guaranteed in the Champions League group stages, had a proper pre season. Celtic are going to have from May the 14th till July the 30th at least without a competitive game. When has that ever happened? I know some players are going to have some uh, June playoff games and uh, Nations League qualifiers with the uh, countries. But in terms of Celtic, they've got all this summer to prepare and they've got the budget set. They know there's £40 million guaranteed to be coming in and they, they, they can plan accordingly. And they've been planning accordingly. They won the league. A few days ago, and they've already announced Forrest in a new contract. They've announced Rogic and um, Beaton are leaving. So they're, 
they never stop off the field either. They're constantly trying to better themselves and constantly trying to see what they can do for next season now. And I think you're going to find, yeah, they're, they're in the market for a left back for sure. Um, they'll probably, even if they get Carter Vickers in, I think they will look at getting another centre back and perhaps another winger as well. And um, but with with Beaton going, I, I wasn't expecting Beaton to actually um, be going. Uh, I thought they would be offered deals and maybe stay on for another season and then leave next season. But they they probably do need to look at having another holding midfielder they can rely on. Um, I'm not sure James McCarthy is the answer for that, especially when for the Champions League. What Beaton's a very European style player. He's very cultured. He's versatile. He's a utility man. He can play plays at centre back for Israel quite often as well. Um, he was always great in the league games to you're holding out for the win, you're holding out for the win them on last time for the you will just calm things down. Um, I think that will be missed. So perhaps central defence is going to be in the market as well now. Um, the type of player that they can go for, they already know as well. They, they're going to be looking for someone who can play in the Champions League, who can play, who's maybe on the verge of. Um, doing well in another European league, um, perhaps another untapped market. Um, Celtic, we know, are going for, um, excuse my pronunciation, this is not Mohamed Jason, I think, is how you pronounce it. Yep. But uh, that, that deal isn't done yet, but it's certainly been targeted and talks had reached an advanced stage a few days ago. So if they could get him in, that is the type of player that they're looking at. I, I'm no expert. I've not done the analysis. I do the news side of it. <laughs> I, I know I'm certainly perhaps going for a player or, or, or in talks with a player. I don't know. I'm <clears throat> going by um, people who've been doing analysis on him. A lot of the fan media have, have done all these um, full in-depth analysis. He seems to fit into what Ange, Ange wants and into the system. So if that helps, then if, if he does fit into that system and if, he, if they do get him in, then great. They need to find other targets, I think, at centre-back, um, central defensive midfield, and also on the wing, um, even if they get Jota in as well. Yeah, one other guy even in that holding role, I think, could be Yusuke Adeguchi. Um, I don't think Ange probably brought him in in January for no apparent reason, whether that was forward planning or not. And I've, I felt quite sorry for him, obviously. He took that injury against Dalawa, and he's not featured too much since. He could possibly be the guy that, that goes in there and, and does the job, but... That we can wait and see for Simon. Just watching Celtic this season, um, obviously the squad's been really, really important. Rotation's been important. Um, it's going to be pivotal going to the Champions League to have a real strong first eleven. Where would you say that the team maybe needs to improve on going forward next year? Yeah, I think obviously uh, looking at the fullback role, uh, I think Ralston has had a really good season. Popped up with important moments. You know, and it's probably been a, a really good understudy to Juranovic when he's not been uh, fit. Taylor, the other side, has more or less played that position all season. So I think he'll be looking for another left back, you know, to challenge Taylor. Uh, I think they want, you know, two players for each position. So I think, obviously, you mentioned, I'm not going to try and pronounce the guy's name, but the, the Iraqi left back, I'll go with just now, but they've looked at him from Hammerby so. That might be one. I agree with Anthony there. I think, you know, a holding midfielder, Beaton has been a fantastic servant to the club. I could get back to the Leverkusen game when he came off away from home. I think that influenced Celtic getting a result that night. You know, I think they probably need somebody there. I know Callum plays there quite a lot. I'll, my preference, I like to see Callum further forward because I think he can create and score goals. So I think they'll probably look for somebody in there. As you quite rightly say there, Idiguchi, I would love to see the guy you know, kick on next season because it's it's been very well, it hasn't even been stop start, you know, it hasn't featured a lot. But as you as you quite rightly say there yourself, you know, he's been identified by Ange, so you'd like to think the guy's got something there. So he might be the one to step into that role. But all in all, I think at a club like Celtic you need year after year to bring quality that's probably as good, if not better, than what you've got to keep moving forward. They're now in the big competition again. We've all 
watch Celtic struggle in the Champions League in recent times. You know, the, the money's that, the gap is that wide. You know, I, I watched Paris and Germain uh, at Celtic Park. So they want to go and reduce that. And I think with the recruitment and the the eye for a player that Ange seems to have, I think he'll use the money wisely. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's four or five new faces coming in just to keep them moving forward. Yeah, and just add an internet squad. Sorry, Anthony. I think they might also look for a striker as well because unless a Yeti bursts onto the scene um, <laughs> in the summer, uh, which seems very unlikely, they've got Kyogo, who is definitely good enough to be a, stri- a striker at Celtic. They've got Giacomacchus, definitely good enough to be a striker at Celtic. Is Maida seen as a striker? I, I don't know. Uh, Celtic. I'm, I'm not sure. I think he played on the wing quite a lot in Japan yeah. and, um, on a more advanced position, but not off the striker and not actually in that number nine role. And so if they don't see Maida as in, as a long-term striker, they should be looking to bring someone in unless a miracle happens with a Yeti. But I, I, I don't see that happening. And I think both parties would would be looking to to move on there. It's, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if Celtic got, got another striker in because I think especially if you're playing European games more and Celtic want to be in Europe beyond Christmas, we'll want to hopefully progress further than Christmas. But I think the, the target should now be Celtic for Celtic to get not beyond Christmas, European football beyond Christmas, but European football beyond February. Um we've seen that it can be done. And it's to do that, I think you need to have quality, at least three quality strikers. And I think Kyogo and Giacomacchus are three, uh, two quality number nines. And I think uh, they perhaps, if they don't see Maida in that number nine role long term, I think they need to, to go in the market for them. Yeah, it's just about adding to that squad, I think, um, which, you know, as, as Sam has already touched on, you know, I think we all are pretty relaxed and trust Ange Postacoglu to sign the right players that are going to fit in at Celtic he's not had a bad signing yet and um, he's got that eye for the player he's got the trust well in the bank from the Celtic support and it's going to actually it's going to feel a bit strange this summer not to have those early qualifiers I mean we've saw the, the, the nail biting tension of Bershevas um, Astana should be battered fighting at Celtic part and I think they went 3-1 up over there and, you know I, I was nervous I thought we were going to go out that night because it's just watching Celtic and Champions League qualifiers is never a pleasant experience, but we're, we're very relaxed going into this. And I think, you know, additions like CCV and Jot early on would really just calm everybody down. And obviously, it's been discussed that there's a potential no deal on the, the table for Ange. So, again, anybody that's worried about him going anywhere, which I don't think he's going to be going anywhere, um, can can really chill out. Um, what did they touched on? Near beat on Tom Rodgick, Simon. Um, <coughs> two of them have been incredible servants to the club, nearly 10 years there. Had the big moments, um, you know, Tom Rodgick especially always likes to come up with a big goal. He, you know, after a poor season for everybody, both of them have been absolutely instrumental this year. That game at Hearts, I think Beaton was actually the captain that night. Um, Rodgick, but that single goal against Mullable in December when we were kind of dragging ourselves on, I think Turnbull actually might have played up top or something uh, that day. Um, how big an influence have both these guys been at Celtic? And how big a miss are they going to be? Yeah, I think I think both are, are, are favourites with the fans for their, their time at the club and what they've been part of. They've been part of the the nine in a row team, huge success over a period. Rogic's goal against Aberdeen uh, to seal the treble. You know, they've been big players. He's, he's popped up with goals against Rangers time and time again as well. And he, I think he's really found his form again with. With Ange, you know, whether it was the Australian connection again, we don't know because at one point it looked as if he was he was leaving the club. Uh, but you know, when I when I seen the the news this morning, I think well, you know, it's it's the end of an era, it's the start of a new era. We we Ange, he's, he said this is just the start of the of the project for him. He's got off to a great start, you know. So whilst it's sad to see these guys because they've been there for so long go as part of been a, a club with Celtic. I think they leave on certainly a high. You know, they've they've regained the championship. They've been both big players uh, and involved heavily in that. So I think they can leave, you know, 
on a real high, and I think they'll go with all the well wishes of the, of the fans of just what they've, they've done at Celtic. Yeah, and there's guys like Mikael Lustig, obviously Scott Brown, and other guys who, you know, it'd be really nice, whether it's in 10 years' time or whatever, to get them all back and just kind of give them that, that proper thank you and send off because it's been a special year for Celtic, you know. 11 titles in 10 years is, is unprecedented success when you start to see guys like Beaton and Forrest, McGregor, whoever. Their trophy hall is absolutely crazy. Yeah, it's um, so it would be nice to, to properly give them that send off. Anthony, how about you? They've obviously been big figures this season. It's been really important, I think, at continuity in there to have guys that have been there, done it, seen it all. And I think just a, a tweet earlier, I've seen it's only going to be Callum McGregor, James Forrest, Anthony Nelson, and Mickey Johnson, the four guys left from Brendan's invincible season. So it's an end of an era at Celtic. But again, I think it possibly signals that we are, you know, again, we don't, we don't stop and it's going to be that in the transfer market that we're not going to hang about here. If, if Ange knows that players maybe want that move, whether it's, you know, maybe Tom Rodgers going to move a bit closer to home, to Australia, um, that it'll let them move on and, you know, we can find a replacement. And I, I don't think he's going to hang about or any sentimentality with people. Yeah, and I, I think you, you just mentioned how well they've served Celtic over the last decade. And that is why their their wish is has been granted to leave this summer because Celtic were keen to to get Rogic and beat on perhaps on another year extension to give them two years left on their contract. But both wanted to seek a new challenge and that because of how well they've served the club, Celtic were happy to respect that and to ha- happy to let them leave this summer. Uh, what, 16 trophies Rogic has won. 18 trophies between his win. I mean, one of the legacies, I feel, from Ronnie Dyla is giving Rogic a game and allowing him to flourish, allowing him to play in that role, and and Kieran Tierney as well, um, giving him his debut. But it's what Rogic has done in those in those years. Because it looked like he was maybe one of those signings who would come in, he's not really done, you know, like a, a Bui Kiwasi, you know, those kind of players. We've seen so many come into Celtic, never really, they get sent on loan or they're on the fringes of the first team, but then after three or four years, they don't cut it and they, they move on. That almost looked like it was going to happen to Rogic um, because he was, he was sending a little Lennon, wasn't he, in uh, yeah. 2012? Um, I think they picked him up. I was doing a podcast with a guy over in Australia and I think they actually picked him up that tour they went over there, I think in 2011, that was when he actually noticed yeah. Tom Rosic at first, and he's obviously the big connection with Nike too as a young boy. Uh-huh. So, this guy has spent most of his adult life at, at Celtic, and he's served the club. So, uh, I'm such a huge fan of Rogic. Uh, I honestly think at times he is the best player in the Scottish Premiership. And, and there were times under the Rogic years, uh, under, under the Rogic years, call the Rogic years, under the Rogers years, where he was on top of his game, he was the best player in the country. And I thought he would perhaps want to move on, maybe even to um, further then. But his, his form was definitely a bit, and he's had problems with fitness, but... And, and just really got him going again, and I thought he would, he'd maybe want to stay another year, give it, have another crack at the Champions League because that's maybe where Rogic hasn't excelled in in Europe. He's been great domestically and scored massive goals uh, domestically, um, like Simon was talking about that goal against Kelly, um, and Dyla brought on the, the goal against Aberdeen to win the invincible medal. Um, goals against Rangers as well, but perhaps in Europe is where which hasn't flourished. And I thought he might want to, to stay on for another season to uh, have a crack, another crack at the Champions League. But Celtic have been prepared for this. And like you say, I, I completely forgot Celtic had got Idiguchi in. I completely forgot that he's, he's this holding midfielder. So he, he could be the man that they were they were looking to fill that void. And you can already see that they were planning for Rogic is Matt O'Reilly. Riley has just come in seamlessly, been Celtic have seamlessly been able to swap between Rogic, O'Reilly, Rogic, O'Reilly, and uh, over the last fifteen games or so, and it, it, it almost doesn't matter who plays because we're going to get the out of both of them. 
And um, if anything, for my way, you take a corner kick and properly whip a ball in. And uh, so it's, uh, it, he's, he's only 21 as well. The future has been laid out. And the, Rogic is leaving can be very sad for him, especially because I think he could really do something in the team next season. But Celtic have a replacement and someone who's ready to already uh, to be in the first team. Yeah, and again, obviously, he worked with Ange at the national team, so I, I maybe thought he would want to maybe hang about for that because he knows him so well as you see, Anthony. Probably in the Champions League and even in the Europa League, he's not excelled in a lot of, a lot of Celtic fans probably. Use that as it as the bar, uh, you know how well can they do? But big moments domestically, which I've touched on there, you know that goal down at Kelly probably shifted it in Celtic's favour that year under Drony. Um, even a goal at Motherwell to win the game four three, and that complete crazy game, the invincible treble wins the one we're all going to talk about. But even this season, you know that that goal at Ibrox, you know right man, right place, right time, and there he was. And I think the game tomorrow is it's going to be emotional because you know he's been such a, a huge figure for a lot of Celtic fans. Um, and this period of success and came up with the big moments so yeah um, it'll be sad to see him go but I think everybody will be wishing both of them very well and as you say Adiguchi's there um, O'Reilly's there I bet you Riley McGree's really gutted he, um, he picked Middlesbrough over Celtic by the way because Big O'Reilly's going to be playing Champions League football and your man McGree's going to be still stuck in the Championship in Middlesbrough so just do football works out sometimes. Um, before we go, Simon, you've got an event on at the end of this month in the, the Armadillo. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about it just before we go? Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm just a member of uh, uh, First Star. We, we, we've done a few events. We did our biggest one to date was uh, in the Heidel in November with Henrik and Sutty and John Hartson. But one of the stars of the show that night was Martin O'Neill. You know, really clever, funny. Uh, he kind of stole the show. So we've had a lot of good feedback. So Martin's coming back to do the Armadillo on the 29th of this month. Uh, and he's got some old teammates or, or players that played under him. Uh, Lambo's going to be there, Jackie, uh, Lubo. And uh, it's, it's going to be a good night. You know, Big Sutty's coming back as well. So I think the chemistry between those two at the, the Heidel was... It was brilliant, you know, there was a lot of joking and uh, Mickey taking, but I think Martin always seems to get the last word being the, the gaffer. So it, it's going to be a good night. Uh, uh, looking forward to it again. Yeah, it'll be quite, some of those players that you mentioned there, they'd be pretty good in an Ange Postacoglu team, by the way. I think, you know, Lambo slipping right into that midfield. Jackie maybe at full back um, and Big City up front would be you not know, too bad a team. So, and obviously Lubo in there. Um, Lubo and Callum McGregor in midfield would really, really. There's no many Lubos about. No. I think I mean Callum McGregor would be a. You know, Lubo, Cal Mack, and Lambo in midfield would be pretty decent. Um, yeah. Been a right Celtic team. Right. But, um, guys, thank you both for your time. Thank you for joining us in this podcast. To, to Simon Donnelly and Anthony Joseph, thank you and enjoy the game tomorrow, guys. Cheers. <laughs>